Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. I'm all my day. When police in Atlanta stormed a music festival in March, being held by activists protesting Cop City, the proposed $90 million police and firefighter training center that would be built on forest land, 23 of the activists were arrested and one, Tortuguita, a 26-year-old indigenous environmental activist and community organizer, was shot and killed. Those who were arrested were accused of carrying out acts of vandalism and arson at a Cop City construction site over a mile from the music festival under Georgia's domestic terror statute, although none of the arrest warrants tie any of the defendants directly to any illegal acts. Cop City is yet another complex designed by the corporate state to train police in urban warfare. The plans include military-grade training facilities, a mock city to practice urban warfare, explosives, testing areas, dozens of shooting ranges, and a Black Hawk helicopter landing pad. It is a war base where police will learn military-like maneuvers to kill black people and control our bodies and movements, Kwame Ofimi of Community Movement Builders points out. The facility includes shooting ranges, plans for bomb testing, and will practice tear gas deployment. They are practicing how to make sure poor and working class people stay in line. So when the police kill us in the streets again, like they did to Rashard Brooks in 2020, they can control our protests and community response to how they continually murder our people, he said. But just as ominous as the militarization of domestic police forces and training complexes to turn police into internal armies of occupation is the use of terrorism laws to charge and imprison activists, protesters, and dissidents. Former Chicago Tribune reporter Will Potter in his book Green is the New Red documents how terrorism laws are used to crush dissent, especially dissent carried out by animal rights and environmental activists. He likens the campaign to McCarthyism in the 1950s and warns that we are on the cusp of cementing into place a police state. Potter, who became a vegan when he was a student at the University of Texas, participated in a canvassing campaign organized by a group called Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty while working at the Tribune. The goal was to close down the laboratory of Huntington Life Sciences, which use, still uses animals for testing. The organizers were arrested for trespassing, and then Potter got a firsthand look at what was happening to civil liberties in the United States. Two FBI agents appeared at Potter's apartment demanding information about the group. If he refused to cooperate, he was told, his name would be included on the domestic terrorist list. Potter would eventually leave the paper to report on the government's intimidation of activists, including nonviolent activists who spoke out against the corporate state and the seizure of political and economic power by the 1%. Joining me to discuss the Orwellian world being erected around us is Will Potter. You, you open the book in the Chicago Tribune newsroom. We both come out of the, the newspaper industry. We, I, we both worked at one point of the Dallas Morning News. Um, and there's a story. You're, you're sent out to cover the killing of a child. Uh, and I think for those who don't come out of that environment, they don't understand the cynicism, maybe even numbness that takes place in those newsrooms and how difficult that is if you actually care. I mean, I always say there's two types of reporters, the ones who care and the ones who don't. That's the real divide in a newsroom. It's not politics. Uh, but let's just open with that since we both come from that environment. Yeah, I think that's a great observation. I mean, something that journalists, uh, we rarely ever talk about. Um, that kind of environment is one in which in order to survive just the onslaught of daily news and uh, blood and guts, and violence, and uh, kind of despair that comes with it, you, know, you have to really get a hardened shell. And I think that's kind of 
um, fetishized a little bit in journalism. Um, we embrace that machismo and just kind of push full steam ahead um, without acknowledging trauma and acknowledging uh, some of these things that we encounter. And that's certainly the environment I, I felt I encountered at um, multiple newspapers, like you said. Um, you want, I, I think like a lot of people, you go into news with ideas about making a difference in the world, educating the public, allowing and, and creating an environment for change and social change to happen. But um, it can be quite crushing and, and cynical as well. Well, those news organizations will beat that out of you. Uh, very quickly. You let them, very, quickly. very quickly. Exactly. Let's talk about uh, the Huntington Labs. So that was, you, you were just handing out leaflets, I think, or something. I mean, it was very, pretty innocuous. Uh, yeah, ex- I mean. Explain, yeah. explain what it was, why it's important, and then I want to go in, because this was a pivotal moment in the animal rights movement. It was. Uh, this was a pivotal campaign, and in that moment, like when the FBI agents came to my door, that time period was pivotal in the campaign also. And so as a little bit of background, this laboratory had been exposed multiple times by undercover investigators working with groups like PETA, and they had documented egregious acts of cruelty, things like punching beagle puppies repeatedly in the face because uh, the technicians were frustrated at their small veins uh, to get an injection or dissecting a uh, uh, monkey that was still alive. And all of this was caught on video and was used um, in a very savvy way to mobilize and and, um, push forward this emerging movement. And what was different about this campaign compared to other animal rights or other protest campaigns is they operated quite differently. I mean, they were not intended on having signs and banners outside of the laboratory because they knew the lab didn't care. The people in the lab didn't care and the people investing in this lab didn't care. Um, so they started targeting the finances of this company. They went after uh, everyone from UPS to toilet paper suppliers. Anyone who had did business in any way with the laboratory was the target of protests. Um, sometimes this was kind of spontaneous demonstrations. Sometimes this was as simple as uh, people anonymously putting stickers or wheat paste or uh, breaking out a window. I mean, the campaign was really that diverse. I mean, from these really kind of small, seemingly insignificant acts of uh, sabotage or uh, even harassment to mass protests outside the laboratories. And what happened is that it was so incredibly successful internationally that it brought the campaign near bankruptcy. And as that was happening, these corporations mobilized their allies in Congress, and they worked together uh, behind closed doors in order to label these protest groups as terrorists and ultimately uh, to convict them uh, and send them to prison as terrorists as well. And we should be clear, so Huntington, which still exists under another name, but it's Envigo, I think is bought up. That's right. Right. So at the time, it was killing between 71,000 and 180,000 animals a year. And these animals were being killed to test for household cleaners, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, pesticides, and food ingredients for major companies such as Procter & Gamble, Colgate, Parmolive. Uh, uh, Talk about the, the, in the book, you write about the two kind of major organizations that confront of animal activists. One is the underground organization. That's groups like Animal Liberation Front uh, uh, and then the above ground groups. Uh, And the underground groups, uh, I think at one point invaded the labs and caused significant damage. And uh, and the, the, the above ground groups, the ones who ended up being prosecuted, engaged in nonviolent activity and organizing. Uh, But the relationship between those two groups uh, we'll get into it later, but that, but the the, uh, the 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 ones who engaged in nonviolent traditional organizing ended up, in essence, being charged for the crimes of the underground <laughs> organizers, even though they had nothing to do with it. Uh, but but talk about the that those relationships. That's really the heart of this entire protest campaign, and and the heart of why I think this case set such a dangerous precedent for social movements. 
You know, in the 60s in the anti-war movement, there's a phrase among activists that we didn't do it, but we dug it. Meaning I was not engaged or I don't know who was engaged in uh, illegal protest activity against the war, but it was loosely in the name of the same cause and it was nonviolent. Um, and so I will support it. Right. And that was the mentality of stop hunting and animal cruelty. And specifically, they ran a website. And on this website, everything related to the campaign was published. So everything from those stickerings and wheat pastings that I mentioned, all the way up to you know, groups like the Animal Liberation Front, doing things like stealing animals from laboratories and breaking into facilities connected to HLS, um, and also property destruction, vandalism, sabotage. Uh, in the scheme of this protest movement, though, there were no, pro uh, no targeting of human beings. I mean, this is something that the Animal Liberation Front has made sure of for decades and something the organizers of Shaq um, were very passionate about. Shaq, by the way, is Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty. That's right. The organization the, that was organized to confront Huntington. They're the ones who are organizing this protest, protest campaign. And really by organizing, the government said this was a couple of people in a house in Philadelphia uh, and in New Jersey that were running a website. And as news came in on the website, um, there was a real intensity around this at the time. I mean, this was kind of pre-social media. Uh, in a lot of ways, I would argue this was one of the first digital campaigns uh, of kind of this new era that relied heavily and even uh, almost exclusively on online workers. And so what the government argued, as you indicated, is that by the shaft organizers, by the above ground lawful groups, saying through their words and their, and their website that they support the ideology of those crimes and they also support um, people doing them. They thought that this was all legitimate in the, in the name of this struggle. Um, the government argued that this created a conspiracy and that conspiracy created an environment that allowed the illegal activity to take place. So in other words, the people who ran the website were never accused at any point of doing any of the illegal things that were on the website, or for that matter, the legal things that were on the website. But the government um, in this ambitious court case argued that they need to be held responsible for creating a criminal conspiracy under the Animal Enterprise Protection Act. Uh, so these activists were convicted of animal enterprise terrorism uh, is the name of the charge, conspiracy to commit that, and conspiracy to violate the telecommunications law. Um, which means that they were collaborating along, uh, excuse me, across state lines in order to protest this multinational company. So in your book, you, you write that the, the reason terrorism laws, this of course was in the wake of 9-11, uh, the reason terrorism laws were employed against animal rights activists was because the corporations were being hurt. And they uh, essentially... Uh, prodded the political leadership in both parties, beholden to corporate money, of course, to uh, to declare these kinds of activities, even nonviolent activities, as acts of terrorism. Uh, they also, uh, uh, through tremendous resources, surveillance resources. Uh, at these groups, I think you, if I have it, if I remember correctly in your book, you, you say it's the longest criminal investigation by the FBI in U.S. history or something. Uh, you write about a woman, uh, her name, she went by the name Anna. Uh, her real name was uh, Zoe Elizabeth Voss, a paid FBI informant. We saw this with Muslims after 9-11, where uh, she provided the, the money, the logistics, uh, at one point, a cabin that the FBI wired to essentially prod people to discuss carrying out a bombing uh, that never took place. And there's this one poor 26-year-old kid who kind of falls for her. And uh, it was entrapment. I think he ended up spending a decade in prison. Uh, but the FBI withheld uh, 2,500 pages of evidence. And so he, he got a, what, a 20, 22 year, 20, 20 year sentence, roughly, and uh, uh, served 10. Uh, and you write that the FBI is estimated to have had 15,000 informants 
in these environmental and animal rights groups. Uh, let's talk about the tactics that were employed against these groups. I think the most important tactic is the recognition of the power of language. And that's something that began really in the 1980s when industry groups made up, I mean, they actually invented the term eco-terrorism and they're quite proud of it. And for the next several decades, as you know, there was a, an international focus on terrorism in a very different context. So in that time through the 80s and 90s, there wasn't a lot of headway on these corporate efforts. I mean, there were gains being made without doubt. But what I found in my research is that after September 11th, the infrastructure and the strategies that were being developed and honed uh, for decades leading up to 9-11 were implement implemented incredibly quickly and boldly after the attack to the point where as first responders were still trying to clear survivor survivors from the rubble after 9-11, and you had multiple members of Congress speculating that the terrorist attacks were the work of environmentalists or animal rights activists. I mean, that's the kind of climate that these groups created. And in that climate where the unreasonable becomes reasonable, where you're blaming nonviolent groups or, or saboteurs um, for the most costly loss of life in U.S. history, in that environment, they were able to kind of manipulate um, other structures to push this agenda. And what I would kind of summarize is that they, did, they did, really did this in three ways. There were three parts to their playbook. Uh, there were legal efforts, there were legislative efforts, such as creating new terrorism laws um, and new protest restrictions. And then there was what I would call extra legal or um, operating outside of the law. And that's where some of these informant tactics come in. Um, the FBI has been um, called to the carpet multiple times by their inspector general's office and oversight boards uh, for their rampant misuse of informants. And that certainly has taken place in the animal rights and environmental movements. But this has also been corporate driven, as in corporations hiring private investigators uh, and mercenary firms that operate outside of the very little restrictions that the FBI has to pursue activists and to create dossiers on them. Um, we've seen this not just in the campaigns we've talked about so far, but also in things like the Standing Rock protests and the Keystone Pipeline protests, where these uh, major corporations are sitting down, and I literally have some of the documents showing it, that they give PowerPoint presentations to law enforcement. They identify protesters. They recommend prison sentences in specific criminal statutes that can be used to go after their opposition. At really every step of the way, these corporate groups have sat down and worked um, in lockstep with the FBI and with uh, those mercenary companies. Yeah. Well, you talk about fusion centers. So this is these are state programs that essentially uh, collate or put together uh, information coming from uh, various law enforcement agencies, uh, but they also work, as you point out in the book, with these corporate security firms. When I went to Standing Rock, uh, uh, you couldn't, they blocked the roads, and the people blocking the roads were wearing Kevlar vests and carrying long barreled weapons with no identification. They were private security drawn from police, drawn from uh, military. Um, and, and, and so, there's this kind of centrifugal force where all of these entities are coming together to target uh, these activists with tremendous amounts of resources. Uh, there, there's a, we both uh, you 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 the uh, film the animal people uh, is a documentary about this uh, uh, the uh, this campaign and um, uh, and in that documentary. Um, you 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 show, or there is an attempt to show, the staggering uh, kind of sums of money and manpower that's been put in to crush these groups. Oh, the amount of resources is just uh, is unbelievable. I mean, especially when you're used to 
I mean, as you all are with the show, you're, you're monitoring social movements and protest campaigns, and you know how little resources uh, these activists have. And so, you know, as, as one of the defendants, one of the protesters put it, when you see um, those court papers that say the United States versus uh, Will or versus Chris or whatever it is, it really is that full weight of the U.S. government combined with the full weight of the corporate state. Um, in addition to some of the things you mentioned, like how this was the largest domestic terrorism investigation in U.S. history, they've thrown just an ungodly amount of money into making these policies happen. Um, one thing that I would throw out is when these activists were awaiting prison sentences on the Huntington campaign. So they were already convicted under this ambitious previous law called the Animal Enterprise Protection Act. They were already being sentenced to, uh, to prison as terrorists for a protest campaign. And politicians and members of Congress uh, and also these corporate rep representatives were simultaneously arguing, our hands are tied. We need more power. We need more money. We need more funding, police resources. And like you said, I, I think you put it quite well that there is this kind of um, centrifugal force that emerges of this revolving door of state agencies and private sector. Um, and really, that's what's happened with this issue. Those forces together have worked over the last several decades to turn nonviolent protesters into the FBI's, quote, number one domestic terrorism threat. And it's really because of their money and influence. They also have twisted the courts. Uh, maybe you can talk about the terrorism enhancement laws. These can add 20 years to sentences. They can, in some cases, quadruple sentences. Uh, and, and let's be clear, these are nonviolent crimes. And this was something, the terrorism enhancement is something that was passed by Congress after the Oklahoma City bombings by right wing groups who killed at, uh, up until that time was the most civilians that had ever been targeted. Um, so in this kind of specter of fear of violence, that's when this provision was passed. And instead, it's been deployed to elevate the sentences of nonviolent environment protesters that were convicted, for instance, as part of the Earth Liberation Front. Um, those sentences not only are exacerbated by the terrorism enhancement, but it also redefines who these prisoners are. Um, I saw that personally visiting prisoners after they've been sentenced and also in my interviews with countless uh, former prisoners, that their experience, once they've been classified that way, is quite different. Um, these activists in, in general have very low priors. Um, they have no serious criminal history. And yet after being sentenced for their protest activity, they can end up in medium or even maximum security facilities. They are called red tagged. Uh, by the BOP, by the Bureau of Prisons, and red carded. That means they have to sometimes carry and wear a large red card, identifying them as a high-risk terrorism inmate. They're treated differently by guards. They're singled out. Um, the ramifications of this, in terms of, uh, from a human rights perspective, extend far beyond just the disproportionate, and I would call malicious uh, sentencing of these protesters. It really redefines them. And I think that's, uh, to me, one of the most surprising takeaways of this uh, language of terrorism is that even though it began as like a public relations maneuver, it's completely taken on a life of its own to the point where it's worked its way into bureaucracies within power uh, that kind of self-replicate these systems after people have even been convicted. Well, they're put in management control units. I went out to Marion, Illinois, and I know you went out there as well in the book, uh, which was replaced Alcatraz as a soup, the kind of supermax prison. Now we have in F Florence, the, you know, the kind of uh, latest iteration of that. But I went out to visit Daniel Hale, uh, who leaked the, the drone papers. Uh, and uh, he, again, it's a nonviolent crime. In fact, it, it, uh, it, he shouldn't even be in prison. But he, like these activist was placed in this, in, in a high security prison, in the middle of farmland, in the middle of nowhere, but in a special, highly restrictive unit. And that's what's happened to many of these activists. And to be clear, I think when people 
uh, in my experience, start hearing about things like this. There's a tendency to either think, one, that can't be true um, because this is the United States, or similarly something like, well, this only happens in X, Y, or Z, other country that has a disdain for human rights. And the truth is that there's actually a long history of using political prisons in the United States in these types of cases, um, including for social movements that we now regard um, by members of Congress even in these kind of heroic terms. Uh, the anti-war movement, the Black Liberation Movement, the American Indian Movement, all have been targeted and, and many of those protesters ended up in experimental prisons. Um, what's I think significant here is these communications management units were opened as clearly, clearly, explicitly political prisons for political prisoners, uh, targeting prisoners because of their communications and their ideology. People were sent there because of their, quote, anti-corporate and anti-government beliefs, according to government documents. And as this is happening, it further codifies and cements um, political repression. It is stabilizing and really introducing what are quite extreme tactics of destroying it and subverting social movements and has turned them into something that's now part of the official government apparatus. And um, these CMUs, these uh, secretive prisons, are now being codified into the law and they are receiving more and more prisoners every year. Um, what started as a, quote, extreme response by the government for dangerous and violent prisoners is now being used against uh, people that are very far from that. And I think that's the mission creep that we uh, that we see and that you're really pointing to here. Yeah, I want to we just have a few minutes left. Uh, you, you write in there about the loyalty oaths that mainstream environmental groups, Sierra Club, Greenpeace, National Wildlife Federation, were kind of called upon to denounce these underground groups, uh, which unfortunately most of them rapidly did uh, or quite willingly did. Uh, but let's talk about where we are now. This, uh, this has created uh, the foundation for a very frightening uh, form of uh, or a very frightening kind of police state where any kind of dissent becomes terrorism. And that's why I opened with the incident in Cop City. Oh, and that's exactly why I've been following Cop City so closely as well, because the dynamics that we've talked about are really starkly on display in that campaign. Uh, not just the repressive tactics, but the movement tactics as well. I mean, it's a similar dynamic to that kind of life sciences campaign, where in the Cop City protests, you have people that are protesting, writing letters, working with church groups, running websites, doing free concerts, like you mentioned, offering free childcare, food, all of these kind of multiple aspects of movement organizing. And then you also have people that have sabotaged property and broken the law. And what the state has done in this case is argue that all of it, the entire campaign, is reflective of domestic terrorism, anarchism, and threats to public safety. So that dynamic is still at play. Um, and so is that I, I think it's right to call a loyalty oath that's being put on mainstream organizations. You know, if you run a national group, it's understandable why it would be tempting to come out and publicly condemn someone who vandalized a bulldozer, right? Because you run a nonprofit, you have donations and staff, and you're not involved in protest activity like that. And you certainly don't want to be at risk, threatened by the FBI. And that's the type of fear that they pray into. And what happens, though, is when more mainstream and established groups start making public comments about the so-called, you know, the radicals with Cop City or the anarchists, which is the you know, kind of classic boogeyman that is rolled out, um, it drives a wedge. And I think in terms of state repression, the intention is to drive a wedge between these social movements inside themselves between the above ground and the more radical groups, and then to drive a wedge between top city protesters and everyone else in the more uh, liberal or mainstream left. And they do that by you know, really uh, tightening the screws on mainstream organizations that have something to lose. 
Yeah, although, as you point out in your book, the, these nonviolent protesters ultimately get charged for acts they did not commit. Uh, they, you know, you, you, I'm not going to go into the details. People should read the book and watch The Animal People, the documentary. But, the, the, you know, they weren't even physically there. They didn't even know these things were happening in many cases. But they're, they're charged. In the Cop City case, it gets even more um, just kind of surreal. I mean, you have bond hearings where protesters are being denied and police are pointing to mud on their shoes as evidence. Right, right, right. That's right. Muddy clothes. Right. Muddy clothes. You know, black hoodies. Um, the the raids of some of these activists uh, that happened recently in Georgia, uh, the warrants. I have to tell you, I don't think either of us would look very good if we were raided, Chris. I mean, our bookshelves can be quite incriminating. And that's the type of stuff that they're listing in these warrants and then dragging it to court as evidence of illegal activity. Um, and I think that's why it's so important for mainstream organizations to fight back militantly against what is happening right now. Staying silent has never protected social justice groups from political repression like this, period. Historically, it has never worked. It has never worked to try to cozy up to corporations or to politicians hoping that they're not going to be targeted in the backlash. Because what happens every single time is at the point you become truly effective, right? but at the point you become a true threat to business as usual is when the full weight of that apparatus is deployed. Um, so I think it, what we're seeing in Cobb City, I, I'm not going to say I'm optimistic or hopeful yet. I mean, I'm, I am a journalist after all, but it is uh, quite um, inspiring, I'll say, to see church groups, community groups, and the diversity of voices that have come out against Cobb City and to me, I think that's really the best defense that we can have against these tactics um, is bringing everyone under the tent and saying very loudly that we're part of this same movement, the same cause, um, and we're not going to be singled out as, as terrorists to stop us. Great. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Grandito, Adam Coley, Dwayne Gladden, David Hebden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrishedges.substack.com. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.